With free agency all but over, going to look into some unintended or intended consequences on different players' situations and which players' situations got better, and which players' situations might have got worse from the actions of free agency. So all that and more on today's episode of Locked on Sharks. Your Locked on Sharks, your daily podcast on the San Jose Sharks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, welcome to Locked On Sharks, the premier hockey podcast covering your favorite team in the Bay Area. My name is J.D. Young, contributor at San Jose Hockey Now and Inside the Rink. I want to thank you for making Locked On Sharks your first listen, probably a part of the Locked On Network where we cover your team every day, or at least during the offseason, three days a week. Um, and today we're going to be looking at kind of what, what unintended consequences or intended consequences uh, of some of these signings and moves Mike Greer made this offseason, um, and which players kind of really helped their situation, and which players maybe hurt their situation uh, going forward. So this kind of a look at, this is also considering Eric Carlson still on the team, uh, so until Eric Carlson gets traded, I'm going to continue to look at this as, as if Eric Carlson is on the team um, going forward, because once that gets happened, there's it's a whole just, Everything we've done, we can just throw away because uh, the Air Carlson trade is going to change this team dynamic, you know, drastically. But um, wanted to, to start with, with you know, players whose stock, I don't know, maybe stock or players who are going to find themselves in different situations or maybe better situations in which players are going to be um, going to be fighting for maybe the same ice time or the same, um, you know, kind of role that they had last year. And I think... Um, you have to start with, with someone, two players whose situation got much, much better this offseason. And that's Tomas Hurdle and Logan Gator. Um, for the past couple of seasons, the Sharks have very much been a, a one line team, right? Whether that was the Hurdle line um, or the Gator line, it felt like it was just one of those lines was working. Um, and that was due to a lack of top six talent, right? Um, you know, other than Alexander Barabanov, it's been kind of a, a rotating cast and Timo Meyer, of course. Um, but it's been kind of a rotating cast of trying to put together guys who can to play with Hurdle and Couture. And you know, they had some success last year, and you know, especially the Hurdle Meyer line and then Barabanov Couture, but it always was trying to find that third person to play with those um guys. And now that Timo Meyer is out the door, of course, in New Jersey, um you know, it the Sharks really struggled last year after the Timo Meyer trade to to find any sort of um, scoring. And I think now with this offseason, you, you you can at least point to what looks like a, a competent top six, right? Um, with the Anthony Duclair trade, um, bringing him in, and then also um, signing Philip Sedina um, to a, a nice kind of one-year prove-it deal. And then you're going to have William Eklund as, you know, going into his a, a full-time NHL job um, this season. You're adding some legitimate talent to the top six. And that's going to make Tomas Hurdle and Logan Couture's life much, much easier going forward, right? It's not going to be kind of a taking turns type of, of situation where you're, you know, maybe Couture's got Timo Meyer for a while and then that line does well, or then Hurdle's got Timo Meyer for a while and then that line does well. Now you can actually maybe have two competent lines. And I'm not saying um, Duclair, Zadina, or Eklund are going to come in and take over you know, uh, Timo Meyer scoring role and do exactly what Timo Meyer did, but you're going to have a much more balanced approach, right? And looking at Duclair, who was previously a 30 goal scorer in the, you know, two seasons ago before he, um, tore his, uh, his Achilles, um, if he can anywhere replicate close to that, if, if you're looking at a 25 goal score from Duclair, again, the Sharks didn't have a ton of, of, you know, goal scorers last year, um, you know, looking at that you had, of course, uh, Timo Meyer be, before he left, he was, you know, on pace for 40 goals. And he hit that when he went over to, uh, when he went over to um, 
New Jersey. Um, but then you had, you know, Eric Carlson, 25 goals last year. And I don't expect us to, you know, see Eric Carlson putting up 25 goals again this year. Um, Couture had 27 goals. Hurdle had 22. And then that's it, right? They only had four guys who had over 20 goals last year. Baraban off his close, he had 15. You know, LeBanc had 15. I feel like Kevin LeBanc surprisingly had 15 goals last year. Um, you know, Nico Sturm had 14. But adding adding some legitimate scoring pop in Anthony Duclair just helps to round out that top six, right? Um, you know, adding a, a guy like Phil Sedina, who knows this is a big year for kind of a make-or-break season for him um, on a one-year relatively cheap contract. Um, again, I know he, he struggled to score consistently, uh, but maybe a change of scenery, new coaching staff, new, you know, some better centers. We talked about the Phillips Adina uh, a couple of weeks ago with his signing. Um, playing like a guy, playing either with a Couture or a Hurdle all season, that's going to be much better position, at least uh, next to him, than he's seen for the majority of his career. And then William Eklund, who's not known as a goal scorer, but did – you know, pot, um, what I think is what 17 goals with the Barracuda last year. Um, again, if, if he can chip in 10 to 15, you're just getting a much more balanced front six and you can kind of rotate guys as, as you need to. And then you have guys on your, we'll talk about the middle six here in a little bit, but you have guys who can kind of step in if they need to get hot or if they get hot or if they're playing well, or like it, it gives you a lot more flexibility uh, than you did la last year. I'm not saying this team is going to be good, but again, you have your you're in a much better situation among your top six, um, and it lets your middle six, bottom six, kind of be slotted a lot better than not having guys play up before kind of where they are were play up uh, a line or play up a position or play up a role uh, compared to what they should be playing. Um, so again. <laughs> They, this team still lacks a bunch of super like superstars, but you can at least see, okay, like it's going to be a little bit more competent, I think. Um, again, still, still expecting Eric Carlson to be traded, and even if Eric Carlson's here, he's going to take a, a step back production-wise uh, because asking Eric Carlson to put up 101 points just doesn't seem feasible again. Um, but you, it looks like they're going to be able to have more guys being able to kind of carry the load, and it's not just going to be Eric Carlson and Timo Meyer and Lone Gator and Tomas Hurdle kind of having to do everything. And I expect um, as we get closer to the season, we'll, we'll talk more about their roles and um, expectations for them going forward but i think hurdle hurdle's gonna be one of my candidates for a, having a big bounce back season because i think he's going to um not have to distribute or kind of take take a back seat to, to timo meyer like he did last year um i think he's gonna have a kind of a much much bigger role this year at least scoring wise so um but you have to look at hurdle and Couture as your two guys whose situation got much much better just because there's better potentially better um, offensive players around them, right? Um, going from, you know, adding Anthony Duclair, you know, William Eklund and Phil Sedina. Pair that with Alexander Barabanov. You have some some solid wingers, uh, potential solid wingers um, that uh, that's supporting cast for you. So those guys have to be ecstatic compared to where they were last year uh, when it was basically Timo Meyer. Barabanov had it, you know, he had a good season, but hadn't really kind of continued to establish himself. Um, and then, you know, hoping that like guys like Oscar Lindblom or Luke Cunning or whomever uh, would kind of step in and take one of these top six roles. So, um, yes, Hurdle and Gator have to be feeling really, really happy about uh, Mike Greer's offseason. So, before we continue and look at kind of the middle six and the bottom, um, which guy's situation got better and which guy's situation got a little bit worse, do need to take a quick break. Uh, talk to you guys about our good friends over at FanDuel. And if now you want to take that first swing on betting MLB, FanDuel's got you covered because you can get 10 times your first bet amount and bonus bets up to $200. That's right. Just bet 20 bucks. You'll land $200 in bonus bets. Win or lose, that's $200. You can spend on betting everything from the money line to over under who you think is going to hit the first home run. Uh, again, 
just keep betting Otani to hit home runs, you're going to win a uh, majority of the time. Um, if there's also a Patrick Bailey throws out a runner um, prop, you should totally do that because Patrick Bailey's awesome. And I don't know why people keep trying to run on Patrick Bailey. They just don't learn. So you can just all in app that's safe, secure, super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you get paid instantly. There's no better place to bet on MLB than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So sign up today. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. All right. So continuing, you know, of course, some of the other consequences of adding guys like Duclair, Zadina, then Eklund expected to make his kind of full-time jump into the NHL. Player situations have got a bit worse. Jacob Peterson and Fabian Zetterlin, right? Peterson was playing on the second line last year at the end of the season, and Fabian Zetterlin um, was considered one of the, the big pieces in the Timo Meyer trade. Um, both of them got re-signed this offseason, and both of them are expected but uh, to make contributions to the Sharks. But now... These guys, instead of being potential second line players, are probably going to be more third line players. And that doesn't mean that they won't play see time, you know, playing on the second line. Um, again, if Zadina doesn't work out or if Duclair, you know, there's always injury problems or if Eklund, you know, needs to go back to the AHL for a, a stint or, you know, Barabanov, who's had struggled with some injuries, remember at the beginning of the season last year and the end of the season. Um, there will be opportunities for these guys, but going into training camp, you have to kind of pencil these guys in as more middle six to bottom, you know, third line guys compared to the end of the last season when they were, you know, especially Jacob Peterson, who had an outstanding end to the season last year um, and was one of the better Sharks players. And it looks like a, a great kind of win win trade for both the Sharks and the Stars um, with that, with that trade with Scott Reedy. But, um, you know, I think Peterson, you know, he's going to have to look up at the depth chart here a little bit. And that doesn't mean that he maybe won't find a way to be one of those uh, second line player. Um, but again, it's just the, the path forward for him is a little, little bit more you have to manage right now. And Fabian Zetterlin, who, I mean, honestly, he said it, we, we all know, did not have a good um, end to the season with the Sharks. And he talked about just kind of the struggle of going through the trade and, and, um, playing with some new guys and going from a team that's basically fighting for a, you know, a playoff caliber team to one of the, the basement dwellers of the league it just was a bit of a struggle for him. But I think we're going to see a much better Zetterlin this year from, for the sharks. Um, you know, and I think he's a full training camp and gets to know the guys and kind of build some chemistry. Um, it'll be interesting to see kind of where he slots in, you know, you, you hope he's more of a, either like a, a souped up third liner or a second line type of player. Um, but, you know, he he's going to have some work to kind of build that trust and that foundation, especially after the way last season ended. And I think um, both these players, again, I still think they'll see time on the second line at some point, but just kind of where they naturally slot in right now, um, things are a little bit tougher for them kind of going forward. So um, another player who, who actually, I think their situation got better, from the off season is one Thomas Bordalo. And, you know, at I think the second half of the season kind of left a bit of a, a, a bitter taste in our mouths as, as Sharks fans and um, kind of where Bordalo is heading. And, um, but I think with the Steven Lorenz trade uh, as part of bringing Anthony Duclair in, um, it really, I think it opened up honestly a spot for him to be a center. And I think that's still his best position is playing center. Um, you know, if you think you have Couture, Hurdle, and then Nico Sturm, and then that fourth center spot, whether it's the third line, um, I think Borlo would be a, a you know, a, a good offensive third line for for the Sharks. I think you you still have to partner him with some, you know, I think partnering him with veteran competent players makes a lot of sense, but. Um, you know, I think Bordeaux's path to playing center in the NHL got much, much easier with Steve Lawrence being traded, right? Um, if you had Couture, Hurdle, Lorenz, uh, Sturm, there's really not a spot for for, uh, for Bordeaux to kind of pop in there. Um, he's still going to have some, some work to do, and I think uh, him versus Ryan Carpenter for that final center spot, or who else, you know, if it's Luke kind of, I know he's played a little bit of center, or 
if they wanted, you know, one of the other wings who's maybe played center at some point, um, they want to try to have one of those guys win, you know, kind of battle it out. But I think at least Bordeaux's pathway to playing center in the NHL next year got much, much easier with uh, Steven Lorenz being shipped out. Um, so I don't know where he slots in. Again, um, I think if you go back to the Bob Bugner days where Bordelow was kind of, he was the third line center on paper, but Couture was kind of taking a lot of those defensive responsibilities, right? Um, even though Couture was the second line center, even but they they sheltered the Bordelow line a lot. And I wonder if, if that would be something that um, David Quinn would look at, but who knows? So um, plenty of time to try to figure out that third, that three C spot. So another player whose situation definitely got worse um, is Oscar Lindblom, who was kind of one of the shortest big signings last year and really, really struggled last year. And he kind of found his role on the fourth line, but um, again, right. You're not, you don't want to pay Oscar Lindblom, um, you know, two and a half million dollars to be your fourth line uh, winger. Right. And I think with the addition of Giovanni Smith, um, Oscar Lundblom probably going to be looking over his shoulder a little bit here because um, I think Giovanni Smith brings a different edge and mentality, you know, a bit uh, more physical player uh, to kind of play that bottom, bottom that fourth line role. Um, then Oscar Lindblom and Lindblom didn't, you know, he played a little bit of PK last year, but they didn't really establish himself as like a, an excellent PKer and wasn't able to score last year. And you just kind of wonder what Lindblom's role is for the Sharks going forward. And you've already have one overpaid wing and Kevin LeBanc, who's kind of playing a bottom six role. Um, do you want two with Lindblom and Le, uh, LeBlanc, LeBanc sorry, um, going forward? So I think Lindblom, he will be on the team, but I could see him a lot of healthy scratches next off or next season just because um, I think, you know, a guy like Giovanni Smith who makes a fraction of what he does and can, you know, you, you see Giovanni Smith of being that tough physical uh, for checking forward um, compared to kind of the rest of the, you know, you don't really – other than Luke Cunning, right? There's not a lot of that type of, of player on the Sharks um, uh, th this season. So I, I think um, Oscar Lindblom, he's going to have, he's going to be fighting for his job and fighting for his, you know, kind of role on the team um, this uh, this season. And um, again, I, I'm very much don't just dress a guy because he fights, uh, but I think Giovanni Smith does have a little bit of pop that we. To haven't quite seen yet from him, but um, you know, from the, the limited times watching him, you know, with, with the Red Wings, um, I think there's a little, there's a little bit something there. So, um, you know, he did have seven goals in 46 games and with the 21, 22 Red Wings and um, scored a little bit with, with the Panthers last season. Um, I think he had four goals in 34 games. Um, again, I think Lindblom, a little bit more proficient scorer, scorer, but I can see Giovanni Smith kind of being that hard nose forward, um, adds a little bit of grit. And if that's what you want on your team, I think that's what his role is going forward. So, um, before we look at the defensemen and, um, and then talk about the goalies here and kind of whose situation got better or whose situations got worse, do want to thank you guys for making Locked On Sharks your first listen again. Proudly a part of the Locked On Network where we cover your team every day. And if you want to be an everydayer, all you got to do is just follow along wherever you get podcasts or you can watch on YouTube as well. Um, you're not going to want to miss this week. We do have uh, Luca Cagnoni, who uh, the Sharks' fourth-round pick in the 2023 draft. He's going to be uh, scheduled to be uh, on for Tuesday's podcast. So or it'll be, yeah, uh, Tuesday Tuesday night on YouTube, Wednesday um, audio. So um, you're not going to want to miss that. So make sure you guys are following along wherever you get podcasts. Uh, again, Luca Cagnoni. So that'll debut Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Pacific time on YouTube. Uh, so make sure you guys are following along there um, or wherever you get your podcast. So um, before, or, you know, we, we talked a lot about the forwards and I think with the defense, it's, it's, you know, again, assuming Eric Carlson's on the team because Eric Carlson is still on the team right now, 
most of the defense kind of stayed the same, right? Uh, Mario Ferraro, right? We know Mario Ferraro's role. Vlasic, we know Vlasic's role. Matt Benning um, established himself as, as a good defender for the Sharks last year. Eric Carlson, as long as Eric Carlson's on the team, he is by far the clear number one uh, defenseman on the team and is going to be asked a lot of for the Sharks team. But um, once Eric Carlson gets traded, this conversation will trade. But right now, Eric Carlson's still on the team, so we are still – going under the presumption that Eric Carlson is going to be a shark for now. Um, but, you know, most of the defense got, got better, but a lot of these defenders, especially some of these young defenders, their situation got worse with Kyle Burroughs being added again. You know, you kind of look at Matt Benny last year. A lot of people were like, huh, with the Matt Benny signing and Matt Benny was a great signing by, um, by Mike Greer. And you wonder if Kyle Burroughs can kind of follow the same role of, especially on this three year, $1.1 million contract. That's a, if Kyle Burroughs works out, that's a great contract for, for him. Um, but you look at guys like Henry Thrun, Nikolai Knizhov, Radim Shimmick, and Jacob McDonald, who all played, you know, a lot of games for the Sharks last year. Um, you know, I know Thrun was kind of a late season addition, um, but, you know, look at the games played for for those guys, right? Um, Henry Thrun played all eight games that he was, you know, basically was able to play. Uh, Kanijov played 12 games last year. Um, McDonald played 25 games after he was acquired. Um, you know, and then Redeem Shimmick played 44 games last year. Um, like, you know, th- those are good chunks of, of, of games, but there's one spot left for those four defensemen. That doesn't even include Leon Gavanke, who I think could be competing for an NHL job, especially if Eric Carlson gets traded. Um, you know, Shakir Mukmadulin, I don't, well, I don't think he's going to be a, on the Sharks to begin the season. Mukmadulin is going to be playing NHL games. I think by the end of the year, especially after the trade deadline, when the Sharks are, ba- are going to probably be out of it. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of guys competing for one job, basically. And you wonder who's going to kind of get the nod for that last spot. If it's Henry Thrun, who played really well, although he does have, he is still eligible to be sent down and uh, with, you know, he can uh, go down to the Barracuda without having to go through waivers. Um, you know, Nikolai Knijov, Radim Shimmick, and Jacob McDonald would all have to clear waivers. And, you know, I, I think... Shimmick is the uh, Kanijov, I think, would be the most likely to be claimed, even though uh, his contract isn't, you know, it's not very prohibitive. I don't I don't think any of them will be claimed. But if I had to put them in order, I think Kanijov would be kind of the most likely to be claimed um, just because he's still young enough. And you, you can kind of still he's still kind of developing, especially after basically missing the last two seasons. Um McDonald, who's basically like you could have him. Um, he's on a vetman type of deal. And then Redeem Shimmick, who still has $2.25 million in the last year of his deal. Um, again, I don't think any of these guys would be claimed, but still, like there, there's all these guys are gonna be kind of fighting for that last spot to play. And um, who's gonna be sitting kind of night in, night out and in as a as a healthy scratch going forward. So um, you know, I, I think. Training camp's gonna be big for these guys, and who can kind of win that last job for him? And I think if it's a tie, you have to give it to Henry Thrun, who's your youngest player and is still has a way to go in his potential. Um, so it's it's gonna be interesting to see kind of who can kind of win win this last job. But all these guys with Kyle Burrows coming in, that's just one less spot that they have that they're able to kind of compete for um, going into this training camp. Again, once Eric Carlson gets traded. Things will get open up a little bit, but then you're going to have more competition with guys like Leon Gavanke who I, or Nick Chichek, whatever. Like you're going to have more competition for some of these guys. Um, now can be for two spots, but um, right now I think Thrun. I just I think David Quinn loves Henry Thrun, and I think he's going to he at least has a bit of an edge going into this uh, into this battle into training camp. So, and then one last guy whose situation um, quietly got better. Is E2 Makanemi. Um, last season, Makanemi was kind of the fourth guy on the depth chart, right? You had Reimer, Capo Kakinet, Aaron Dell, and then Makanemi. Um, now, with Aaron Dell gone, Makanemi's the clear 
Barracuda starter. Um, we'll see what kind of what happens behind him between Magnus Krona and Georgi Romanov, um, who's going to kind of take that role as, as the backup and who's going to go playing with in the ECHL with the Wichita Thunder. But McAnemy, he's got a clear path to be the guy and, you know, kind of take a, a good run at establishing himself as a potential future uh, answer for the Sharks, at least in net. Um, and with Aaron Delgon, and we know Mackenzie Blackwood's history of not being able to stay healthy, even though McAnemy hasn't been able to stay healthy, um, there's a real legitimate world where E.J. McAnemy is dressing and playing NHL games for the Sharks this season. Um, you know, if you put the over under at 10, like, right. Now you, you feel kind of like that. That feels like a pretty good number for E2 Makanemi, especially um, if Blackwood continues to not be able to stay healthy um, this season. Uh, Kapokakin has been well, you know, he's, he's had a pretty good track run of, of staying healthy for the season. That doesn't mean he's played well, but he's been, you know, pretty healthy um, and available for the majority of his career. But um, the past couple of seasons for Blackwood have been a struggle for him to stay healthy. So um, I think McAnemy, he's, he's kind of the last man standing of, of this uh, goalie room, or at least the, the prospects for, you know, compared to Aaron Dell last year and Strauss Mann, both gone, uh, James Reimer gone, like you two McAnemy is kind of the last hope right now until some of the other guys continue to develop. So, um, yeah, for his situation, he's going to be the number one goalie for the Barracuda and probably going to play a fair amount of, of games in the NHL next year. So, uh, I, I, like I said, I put that number right around 10. At least that kind of makes sense to me right now. He looked really solid with the Sharks last year and very limited sample size. Um, but I, I liked what I saw with watching him with the Barracuda. It's just can he stay healthy? Can he stay healthy? That's the big question for him. So um, that's going to be it for me today. Uh, again, trying to cover all the kind of players who I think the situations got better, right? And I think Hurdle and Couture have to be much, much happier than they were, um, you know, four months ago at the end of the season um, to where they are now. At least the potential of playing with some some legitimate top six guys. Um, with the additions of uh, Zadina and Duclair, and now with Eklund expected to be kind of a full-time NHL player this season. So, um, but yeah, that's. I think those guys are going to be much happier. Uh, it'll be interesting to see which guys in the bottom six or middle six can kind of rise up, and um, who's going to win that that last defensive job. So we'll, as we get closer to the training camp, we'll dig into these training camp battles a little bit more. Um, but. That's going to be it for me today. Like I said, Luca Cagnoni uh, scheduled to be on for uh, so that'll be come out Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Pacific time on YouTube, and that'll be in your podcast feed on Wednesday uh, at midnight. Um, and then we're going to start our Get to Know the Enemy series where we're going to start digging into the rest of the Pacific. Uh, I'm going to be doing the crossovers with the, the rest of the locked on NHL hosts uh, to kind of see what's happened in the Pacific Division. And it's been a chaotic um, off season for a lot of teams and kind of get the state of the franchise for them kind of their big questions heading into training camp and kind of some early, um, you know, season predictions for them. So uh, make sure you guys are following along wherever you get podcasts or you can watch on YouTube. Um, you can follow the show on uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and threads at Locked on Sharks. You can follow me on Twitter and threads at my fry hole. And until uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday, bye friends.